Good morning everyone. Thanks for joining us on the day 2 of the academic conference hosted by the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences IIT Madras centered on the theme of migration. Today as part of the development studies session we have Professor Aparna Raipol delivering the keynote lecture on the topic the predicaments of migration reconfiguring boundaries and citizenship. Professor Aparna Raipol did her PhD in sociology from the University of Pittsburgh and is currently professor and head of the department of sociology in University of Hyderabad. Joining the, after joining the department in 1994, she also served as a director of the Study India program between 2009 and 2014. Her areas of interest include the sociology of gender, Indian diaspora, urban sociology and qualitative research methods. Her research includes the exploration of diaspora and gender in the Indian context as well as globalization and gender in the Indian context. She has authored the book Negotiating Identities, Women in the Indian Diaspora which was published in 1997. On behalf of the conference team as well as everyone else associated with the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Professor Aparna Raipur. Once again, I welcome you all to what promises to be an enriching session on migration with focus on migration with the, within the nation as well as migration and immigration across countries. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. A very good morning to all of you. Let me begin with um, a note of thanks to the students of the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences in IIT uh, Madras. I am particularly thankful to Aaron who wrote this lovely note of, uh, you know, inviting me here and little did I know that these are all MA students, you know, I am so glad that I said yes because we do so many conferences but rarely those that are, um, you know, organized by students and it has been impeccably organized, done so much in advance with such little, um, you know, little detail being taken care of. I am absolutely amazed and happy and I wish that you continue. Special thanks to Aaron, Madhura and Yashashwini for being in touch with me. Well, um, I am going to move away from conventions and uh, I have a couple of internet clips which I thought I'll show you but I decided I'll just go by my first, uh, you know, plan as to not show you any media. It's early in the morning and you know many of you would have gone late to bed late at night social media other media all kinds of things so please bear with me and do a, i'll do a conventional lecture where you know i can make eye contact and try to see if i can actually elicit a discussion uh, my title today is the predicament of migration reconfiguring boundaries and citizenship one of the very very fascinating aspects of course my um, approach to migration is from diaspora and for me they are inseparable and we already started that very interesting discussion on diaspora with Radha Hegde's um, you know um, interactive session last evening. So I will be referring to some of those aspects but today I am really going to talk about the you know, real reconfiguration of borders and boundaries and what we actually mean. So I was, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you caught um, that thing that happened. Delhi is going to election today and I see people nodding already. The Northeastern immigrant. You know, I have several Northeastern students in my class and we had this interesting discussion the other day. Uh, they had the BJP manifesto actually had a title saying immigrants from Northeast and of course the opposition parties jumped on them and the BJP said no, no, it was a typo. But I think I want to flag off this whole thing about who is a migrant and who is an immigrant and what do these definitions mean? Are these definitions legal? Are they political? Are they social? Or are they much more than that? So we need to understand the intersectionality of caste, class, race, ethnicity, gender, religion, region in a very central way when we talk about migration. So I want to start off with that. And migration of people and the large scale transformations they are sure in have long been a preoccupation of all social scientists around the world. 
migrations across borders has usually accompanied formation of nations or states within a nation. I am just coming from a state which has been split into two and we are, so when I go out every time, when I go to give a lecture and we step out for tea, the first question that is asked is, you know, how is it the new Telangana? And I don't know how to answer that really as yet. And that's not the topic of my discussion today, but I'll be happy to get into that. What I'm saying is, what does this split actually mean? What do these boundaries and borders mean? Who am I? What is my identity? You know, so that becomes an interesting question as well. So, um, historians have looked at trajectories of people moving around the globe for centuries, noting important events and tracking formations of empires and the onset of modernity within democratic states. Policy makers have been attempting to present the panoramic nature of migration and examine ways in which economic turmoil has often led to both forced and voluntary migration in the world. I think the whole idea about the agency in migration, what is forced labor? You know, historically, if you look at indentured labor as a kind of forced labor, then it is a repercussion of the colonial period. So who was forced to go where? But then at an individual level, it may have, may have been seen as a voluntary migration and not as a forced migration. So I think we also need to, you know, get that situation very, very clear. What is voluntary? I might think I'm voluntary, but what are the circumstances? Is the state involved in making a migrant a forced migrant even to this day? So that is something. So the voluntary forced uh, continuum, I do not look at uh, two boundaries at the opposite end of the spectrum because they do not exist in real life. So I think oppositional entities don't, but I look at even voluntary and forced which seemingly, uh, you know, appear oppositional as two ends of a continuum. So they may be historically forced migration and several generations later, it actually becomes and begins to be extremely voluntary. How do we actually see that? And uh, having introduced generation, I must say that in my own research, um, generation is an extremely important part of intersectionality. Which is the generation that is the migrant? You know, the great grandparent has surely got very, very different historical, social, economic circumstances than someone who comes later. That becomes an important entity as well. Um, sociologists and anthropologists have focused on people, change, and the processes of assimilation and acculturation that are often associated with migration. Scholars of migration discuss migration from perspectives unique to their own discipline and present its importance to understanding the spread and consequences of geographical movements of people in the contemporary world. So we have people, you know, in your own center, for instance, department rather, you have humanities and social sciences and I don't need to talk about the importance of interdisciplinarity for you. So, but when you study migration and development, I think that whole nexus of, you know, how has the historian built it up becomes extremely central and then we focus on the legal aspects of migration, the economic aspects of migration and of course as a sociologist I am interested in the whole politics of process and politics of change. Um, so, the connections between places made by people before the formation of nation states are clearly the result of migration. So, did migration precede the formation of nation states? Obviously, yes. It's a very obvious yes answer. But when I am framing a research proposal, I need to understand that as well. I cannot take that for granted anymore. Um, so, the borders are created only after people's mobility between places. And the struggle of people with states and their attempt to control migration results in the idea of citizenship. What is the idea of citizenship? What is the sense of belonging? This is what diaspora studies and migration studies has been talking about so much for the last 30 years. Borders took shape and began to control the mobility of people and this was inextricably linked to the creation of the nation state in the singular. You know, I think that is a very, very 
important part of it. And to just take a step back from India and put India within the context of larger Asia. In Asia, the colonial domination controlled migration before or even after empires became nation states. The sojourner became a settler, leading to a condition of what is called the diaspora. Let me take a minute, you know, just like I said, voluntary and forced. The other continuum that I engage with particularly in migration and diaspora studies is the sojourner versus, I am using the word versus here, the settler. Because I think, do you consider yourself a migrant? When you are a student coming from Mizoram and studying in Hyderabad or Chennai, then surely you don't see where are you from, constantly being asked that question, where are you from? And if that person says, I am from Bombay, you look stunned because you look like you are from Mizoram. So racism in the question itself, you know that is a very very inherent part. But then the sojourner never thinks of it as racism because the sojourner to give you a technical term is a temporary migrant with basic goals. And usually migration in sociology is absolutely linked to the concept of social mobility and social stratification which we as sociologists have been so, so much um, concerned with over the last 200 years. You know, so the sojourner becomes the settler and then what happens? So even when you see a Bengali in Chennai and they say where are you from then they have to explain and say my grandparents migrated because of that consciousness what exactly is that consciousness that we are talking about so the sojourner often became the settler leading to a condition of today what we call diaspora within a nation urbanization is the most significant cause of my, uh, you know migration again another lens from rural to urban has been a preoccupation of the sociologists and that has led to the greatest numbers of people moving from villages to cities in huge population countries like China and India the second half of the 19th century brought in Asia's mobility revolution periods of large scale violence forced mass migrations China, Japan, Vietnam, Cambodia, Myanmar, Iraq and parts of Asia and Afghanistan have all experienced political turmoil and the concept that you in a development studies program are often concerned with again another interdisciplinary concept displacement you know so we are talking about the displacement of people but you know displacement as an environmental concern displacement as a social concern displacement as a demographic entity you know, that is something that we need to understand. The uneven economic development in Asia led to what traditional scholars of migration like to call the push factors and the pull factors and what historian Sunil Lamrit explains as economic inequality leading to people's mobility. So, the creation of post-colonial states, says Amrit, led people to becoming mobile in the name of national development. Environmental and subsistence crises led to people escaping from climatic shock and settling in more habitable places. Today, you know, environmentalists are saying that it's people who created these kind of crises and those are the development crises, but that's not the center of my talk today. It's impossible to understand global economic transformations without looking at the movements of labor force over the centuries. Where has labor gone? And today, you know, Unfortunately, most of us look at labor primarily as construction labor. We are constructing so much, particularly in our cities, that it's absolutely frightening. Whether it's Asia or the rest of the world, it's the same story. So, the labor force has networks and kinship ties that migrants bring with them and will continue to shape the magnitude of both internal and international migration. 
So nations and cultures have long been defined by both geography and territory. So when we are talking about the economic transformations, obviously the migrants and the groups have been going to places that have been much more open. There is an interesting connection between a visual device of a map and the ordinary use of language. You know, the term nation is commonly referred to in English, Sanskrit, as well as in other languages as land, soil. So, England, Switzerland, Thailand, Bangladesh, Andhra Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh. So, the term whole country can refer to a territoriality of a state or I am more interested in the people of the state. The geographer is interested in the territor territoriality of migration. The sociology is interest in the peoples or the migrants themselves. So that is the connection. But then the linguist, very interestingly, the conceptualization of migration is a very much a linguistic and a language entity. One dictionary definition for land is people of a state, you know. So, soil has also, also been referred to as national soil. It is not uncommon for a person going to exile to kiss the national soil or to carry a little soil with him. Again, gender, the male migrant, dharti, you see so many images. And what is the song that happens at every Independence Day and Republic Day and what is the image that comes to you? You know, you need to think of that itself. So, emotional uh, demonstrations to the soil act as evidence of the loyalty of patriotism. Again, for my generation, patriotism was a very, very interesting other side of the coin of the nation. It's ha I'm saying for my generation because for you it's becoming less and less an image. It's more a materialistic image with Republic Day and Independence Day sales and you rush to the mall and buy a t-shirt with a flag on it. That's an American capitalist syndrome which has also come in. Symbolizes the nation state. Probably does it. It's not your fault. But I think, you know, it's, it's, it is capitalism at play. So there was this thing when the Indian migrated to America and said, you know, they have towels and underwear with a flag on it. It's absolutely disrespectful to the nation state. We do have towels too, probably not underwear yet, but we might see that happening as well. What does it actually mean? What do those colors mean? If you happen to wear a you know, pair of uh, chappals with orange and green on it, are you disrespecting the nation state? Did you even think of the nation state? You know, this is a very, very interesting imagery that is coming in. So emotional demonstrations are linked, of course, to the capitalist syndrome. Related to the concept of space is the idea of home, which is a physical as well as an emotional space. Home becomes a central issue when a person needs to leave it in search of greener pastures. The pace of border crossings has risen to a new crescendo with migrants seeking to configure cultural boundaries and create new representations of themselves, their past and their new cultural milieu. This is a metaphor I have been working with ever since I started my research in the diaspora, you know, the whole idea of cultural boundaries being transfigured. Often, for the increasing numbers of middle class professionals arriving, typically in the western capitalist world, immigration is a self-imposed exile driven by economic and social aspirations. In the contemporary world of transnational cultural exchanges, movements of people between nations is no longer an exile, you know. So when you talk about home, it is in both migration and diaspora studies a concept that is linked to exile. You know, for the definition of diaspora itself is linked to exile. Again, what I started off with, forced migration, it comes from the Jews. You know, the whole idea of the Jewish migrant who is not a migrant if you look at the migration as a voluntary process but someone who had gone away but there is in the Jewish syndrome a very very important connection to when I say emotional connection to the homeland for you I don't know if you're you know reading things that 
make you think that but when, with my reading and my own training homeland is always linked to Israel for the Jews several generations away but still there is that connection to the homeland you know so I think the Israeli state also has a very very close connection to the American state because the Jews are very an important group yesterday Radha Hegde was talking about the melting pot syndrome assimilation is a very very important part of the process of the history of the nation state that is have or that has become the United States of America so to move from a model of assimilation to move into a model of cultural pluralism even within the cultural pluralistic model the homeland of the Jews is still a very very strong and important metaphor you know so religion the ecclesiastical connection to religion is also a very very important one so um, often for the in increasing numbers of middle class professionals arriving in the uh, west in the second half of the 20th century um, I think immigration is what they consider and here I have moved away from the social to the individual to the individual as you know almost an exile which is economically driven you know a self-imposed exile that is what I was going to say a self-imposed exile which you may or may not agree with in that sense but the connect to the homeland is China or Greece or India or Malaysia the same as it is for the Jews so for those of us scholars of diaspora and migration studies we have always struggled with the aspect of is the um, you know term diaspora useful so I'll give you a personal uh, moment in my own academic uh, struggle which uh, is so central to all this my PhD thesis was titled gender in the making of an immigrant community you know my book that Oxford University Press published three years later became negotiating identities women in the Indian diaspora you see the difference from an immigrant community it became Indian diaspora I had to struggle with the intellectual definition is this a diaspora this was in the 90s when we were not today you use the word rather use the word diaspora as if it is has been already there but my own work is part of the struggle of the consciousness whether it is a migrant immigrant migrant was a sojourner an immigrant was a settler settler with citizenship or without citizenship is the second question but more settler what does settler mean you in development studies know that the word settle means an economic entity not just a legal entity you need to buy property you need to look at things so it's very very interesting in that sense so um, the contemporary world of transnational cultural exchanges movements of people between nations is what I'm saying no longer an exile in any sense or at least an exile in the Jewish sense so if you see some of the um, images or homages I should say that the Jews have made to the Holocaust you know Holocaust museums other kinds of things you will understand and appreciate why the word exile why the word homeland has such strong historical um, in, you know memories so the newly constructed um, you know identities and cultures get delocalized but rarely detached from places of past and past times and present times so the newly reconstructed identities arising out of transnational migrations first time I have used the word transnational here because we used to say in migration out migration in a demographic sense what did, what was in and out it was usually within the nation states but say migration from 
Bengal to Tamil Nadu. You know, I'm not even saying West Bengal. At that time, it could have been East. So, what does that mean? So, but then today we are talking of transnational migrants. So, from internal migration, again, the demographer, you would have had classes where you studied internal migration and not external but international migration. But today we are talking about the concept of transnation, you know, more in terms of across. So, you have the Jamaican in Queens, New York. The Vietnamese in San Francisco, the Punjabi in Toronto, the Cuban in Miami, a very, very complicated migration across small border but huge political differences, huge, you know, communist versus capitalist ideological forces. I was in Cuba. I consider myself very, very lucky when I went in there. But I went in an American ship that was teaching. So believe it or not, we were given the option of putting Cuba stamp in our passports. And I said, yes, it is a historical monument. I want it. So you are an Indian citizen, right? Because if you are an American citizen, please think twice about this. They were told. So I think out of the 600 people on our ship, students and teachers, only about 50 of us got the stamping because they don't want un to create. So they were also given the option. So they don't have, you know, emotionally they have photographs, they have, but the passport does not need that kind of a stamping. It's a very fascinating kind of, you know, when we talk about borders and crossing. So the Cuban in Miami are based on memories that are diverse, selective and particular. Memory is an extremely selective thing. Not just for those patients of dementia, but even for those of us who are supposedly normal. We have very, very selective memories and we love to forget. And that's human. There's nothing, you know, so all of us do that. So very, very selective memories as to what you want to remember, what you want to represent as your home or Indian. This is because there's an intrinsic discontinuity between, not only between geographic territories, but also between cultures and societies. Lisa Mark, he talks about the arboreal metaphors, you know, the arborescent roots that, you know, make connections with place. People derive their identities from their ties to a nation conceptualized as a grand genealogical tree rooted in the soil that nourishes it. Um, I will come to the ministry in a little bit, but I think there was a big project that was taken up. Uh, it, it was either called Roots or Rooting and a lot of people of Indian origin from different parts of the world came into this and they were saying, you know, we are in search of our roots. So what does that really mean? What is the problematic of an arborescent metaphor and what is this? Um, so, the, so it in, invokes territorial rootedness. As anthropologists and sociologists have always said, the natives, the orientalist image of the native that was said to us by anthropologists is now spread far, far and wide and the third world, again in quotes, occupies a space within the first. So what Appadurai, Arjun Appadurai was also talked about yesterday calls the spatially incarcerated native which all of you will be familiar with now rooted to one's place and culture but is suddenly free. So the sojourner is the settler, the uh, what should I say, the colonized is free and there is you know, very, very interesting kind of things. He argues that the spatial incarceration happens because of a physical as well as an ecological immobility. Indigenous people are seen as rooted in their soils. When you're talking about displacement, and you know, we also may fall into the trap of saying, oh, they are rooted to their land. But what does that rooting actually mean? Uh, who is the power structure in that sense? Um, and that is collapse as an environmental issue. Just like eco-feminists sometimes essentialize gender, we have a problematic in that as well. How does one understand that? So, if an indigenous person, quote unquote, moved to a city or out of a country, the issues may not be under ban of environment, but 
they might just be clubbed in world rain forest day you know is that something that is real there is a freedom as well as a new creation of a spatial identity that often collapses with the cultural so there is the spatial and the territorial and the cultural which is often fused or combined so the disjuncture between place and culture cannot be seen as a may homogenization of cultures like westernization or americanization but a heterogeneous blooming of distinctive identities independent of each other and the us salad bowl or cultural pluralism to go back to anthropologist clifford gleertz like nostalgia diversity is not what it used to be so you cannot understand a concept such as diversity and i and you know i will privilege my own discipline here and that is sociology in saying that we move on with concepts much more easily than some of our other colleagues in other social sciences so diversity is something that cannot be seen as frozen in history as well um again nostalgia for some of you uh, who are not in diaspora or migration studies is very very interesting and uh, sometimes we talk about this nostalgia which is not just for the past but it's also a nostalgia for the contemporary frederick jameson calls it nostalgia for the present you know how do we actually see that um so neither nostalgia nor diversity remain unproblematically pure and simple homeland people construct sent to be fictive communities part real and part imagined as rushdi says there is a, a sense of loss felt by for him exiles and expatriates the word that's used by rushdi is again expatriates and there is this urge to reclaim what was lost in the process of reclamation he says we will not be able keep sorry capable of reclaiming precisely the thing that was lost we will in short create fictions for him fiction is more important as well not actual cities or villages but invisible ones imaginary homelands or indias of the mind the so unquote um in imaginary homelands when he's talking about it he is also you know in an interview somewhere he said i always have to establish the fact that i was or am an indian so for him you know the india that he imagines is the city of bombay bombay you know so that is not mumbai that's also an important part of what it is um the term homeland has a lot of layers and meanings in the mind of the immigrant identities and memories get transformed over time and as a result they tend to be subjective constructions of reality rather than objectively fixed phenomenon my teacher roland robertson explains this condition as one in which we are participants in the process of involving the universalization of particularism and the particularization of universalism this tension between the universal and the particular can be seen with scores of hindu temples one of which i had looked at um during my study uh, of pittsburgh in, on in the, you know dotting the american landscape and on the other in the use of electronic bulletin boards there was a very interesting study by anjana narayan and vandana purkayasta on you know the hindutva and identities that are created on electronic bulletin boards and you know that's um, something that was done a few years ago so um and also not just by south asians but by palestinians in exile or the expatriate irish to promote particularism such as nationalist or fundamentalist movements back home and of course in the 80s khalistan was another major movement which was most more popular in north america and the united kingdom than it was in punjab so that is also something that has been written about a lot um uh, so what uh, edward said had called a generalized condition of homelessness i have a little bit of a problem but of course 1979 you know when he's talking of orientalism just a few times ago the generalized condition of home so today what i am dealing with in my own research on reverse migration or return migrations is the concept of multiple homes so from homelessness to multiple homes so multiple homes could be in multiple locations you know i've lived in uh, my colleague will say i've lived in hyderabad all my life but i will go home to settle in bhubaneswar but he's never lived in bhubaneswar then 
he would say that when he's in his 60s maybe early 60s but after 65 he'll say i have a house in hyderabad i think i'll continue to live here so then that home brubhuneshwar becomes only a physical home that you go to relatives but real home is hyderabad because he's lived there for three decades so this is within the nation but this could happen even across nations today i won't get into that immediately i'm coming to that a little later so for thousands of these displaced persons where said had talked about the journey from the ex colony to the post colony you know so historically you have come from a colonized nation why do you have so many africans african muslims in france a journey from the ex colony to the post colony that is a very very important entity and why do you have so much islamophobia in france that's another aspect that needs to be understood and it has been understood as well um so benedict tangdison's idea of imagined communities assumed a new meaning in the immigrant context so in the 90s this was a very very popular phenomenon and i quote from uh, uh, akil gupta and james ferguson it becomes most visible how imagined communities come to be attached to imagined places as displaced people cluster around remembered or imagined homelands places or communities in a world that seems increasingly to deny such firm territorialized anchors in their actuality remembered places have served as symbolic anchors of community for dispersed people this has long been true of immigrants who use memory of place to construct their new lived world so the uh, whole thing about um memory and then the early days on immigration where you think about right about the banyan tree so that also what is india what is the ideal india how do you look at the ideal india so at the university of pittsburgh there was this like that kind of room you know it was a very interesting kind of uh, phenomenon over there because and this is our interpretation as graduate students who are trying to oppose it you don't need to represent the diversity of india of course we were talking about something entirely different but this indian room has only had lalanda and of course it was being conceptualized by the diaspora that had arrived the diaspora that had the money you know this was a very very interesting aspect of what gets represented and how do we actually represent this so um there's also you know um i've i've come now to look at the indian so indian diaspora is referred generally um it used to migrants who originated in areas falling within the territorial boundaries of space of the present day india so for this purpose we are looking at the diasporaizing of indians who are dispersed in different parts of the world and you know bikuparik and others stem from political economic cultural conditions so th- there is again the idea of the diaspora that served to use a uniform identity but now i want to shift the lens to the homeland that i was talking about the nation state ever since the 1980s okay leading to 1991 which is liberalization dnri has become an important figure in the government okay why simple economic developmental reason as they needed foreign capital to invest and finance the expensive imports the then bjp led government in 1998 proposed a special card the pio pay attention to this because this is going to be an important part of this in the next 5 years things are going to change as i speak um so the pio would allow them certain economic benefits as well as retain some form of citizenship this clumsy attempt at imposing a broad category subsuming the varied composition and experiences of people living in different parts of the world is based on certain stereotypes of the nri the economic entity if you look at it you know you economists and you can do it better than me but historically since the 1991 period to now look at the way that different bank accounts have changed from the nri account to the nro account to making it easy transfer 
you know basically to allow you to invest in the nation so i want you to invest as a good nri is the nation calling in that sense so the clumsy attempt at imposing a broad category subsuming the varied composition and experiences of people living in different parts of the world is based on certain stereotypes of the nri the media typically represents the nri as a wealthy businessman they does not look at you know the poor gulf migrant who has gone as a sojourner for 4 5 years but even that gulf migrant is contributing immensely back to the nation state but you always look at it as a wealthy businessman again gender um for the upper caste middle class families in india immigration to the west was a seen as a sign of upward mobility their post colonial cousins have made it in the us and are constructed as an ideal community a model minority you know their niece um, in uh, uh, doing doing her medicine comes and spends um, you know her time learning bharatanatyam at kalakshetra and she becomes both a doctor and a dancer that's the ideal model minority because they made it and your own child here is hanging out you know not doing anything that you want to be indian so that's again a problem for the cousins back home so who is presenting a better image of india the non resident indian is perceived as someone who in spite of being physically away reproduces indian culture in terms of dress language religion customs in an alien land romantic picture completely erases the complex history of the indian diaspora and the various routes it has traveled historically geographically economically and politically there is a close relationship between the study of di- migration diaspora and return and that's what i am interested in right now but an interesting aspect of migration is return to the homeland for the diasporic combination population it's also combined with the need to define the relationship to state and citizenship when so many countries allowed dual citizenship what about india has been asked then the introduction of the overseas indian citizen the oci you know the oci is a very very important phenomenon the oci card considered a step toward dual citizenship and maybe modi will make dual citizenship possible very soon you already have a lot of people coming in without prior visa or visa on arrival is happening and you are reading it so these things are changing so fast so people like me need to keep pace with what they are actually trying to do but what repercussions does it have so you look at the possibility of multiple homes so as it from affiliation to the homeland today you are able to invest and make multiple homes with economic political and emotional meanings for establishing residency and allegiance in the country sorry one more thing what does the oci card give you it gives you all the privileges except buying agricultural land and voting voting means of course you also can't stand for election so you can buy your property you can also come to india without the visa problems that your parental generation faced you know because they had to sit there for 5 years green card yeah you know all kinds of complications and you are also sponsoring a lot of people who came from your villages in gujarat you know so if you look at multiple migration for instance since i said gujarat where is india it's not there for the gujarati migrant who had gone to east africa and after idi amin's time you know forced migration to britain then voluntary migration to the united states what is india it does not exist because the people who left gujarat probably left before india so for the you know when mrcc p masala was made some years ago meera nair actually looked at this with in a very very interesting way but today you know 20 not 20 but maybe at least uh, 15 years later we are also looking at a very very different kind so the migrant from a village in gujarat to kenya or any other place uganda is somebody who is quite different in that sense so when you give them the oci card are they really interested you know it also costs a lot of money so for establishing residency and allegiance to the country that has one migrated to they work as a material fulfillment to con american citizenship but still feeling nostalgic for their homes that they left behind so with the passing of time and their own children growing up and beginning to feel at home in the diaspora the immigrant moved from the sojourner to the settler bought property to con citizenship 80s and 90s were anxious decades for those who left india in 60s and 70s 
okay but today they are more comfortable with multiple homes in multiple locations because they have attained familial professional successes relationship with the home country is different they just come any number of times you look at a passport i have a an example dr reddy ps reddy from pittsburgh established medicity hospitals in hyderabad 20 years ago he is a cardiologist at the university of pittsburgh he is a cardiologist he has not resigned from university of pittsburgh he spends probably 180 days in india in hyderabad and the rest of it in pittsburgh is he a pittsburgher is he a hyderabadi i don't think dr reddy knows but he set up medicity hospitals he's doing a lot of work around the villages he's you know started nursing schools done all this and he says uh, when he says home he has his home in fox chapel pittsburgh but he lives in a guest house in medicity hospital in hyderabad so i don't know you might say home is pittsburgh his wife might say home in pittsburgh his children are in us i don't know ultimately he's already 70 plus he's been doing this 6 months 6 months for 10 years i don't think i can call him an american i don't think they will call him an indian so that is what is multiple homes nearly at the end of the first decade of the 20, uh, 21st century one has to be conscious of what this return to the homeland means so the oci allows one to have the privileges and these things will also change i'm sure we will move toward dual citizenship because it benefits the nation now i'm looking at return migration from gulf the most certain migrant labor are given specific contracts and in you know people with U us and uk citizenship by property in cities like bangalore hyderabad chennai and now not hyderabad only but vijayawada and visakhapatnam with telangana having come there you know a lot of the migrants felt that they have invested in hyderabad and what does that actually mean after the state got divided so i think this is something which is very very important but you know i'd like to kind of bring this discussion of nri oci you know we are talking about difference in class when we talked about migration but i also would like to look at the idea of migration whether it's reverse or two as a gendered concept female migration is seen has been seen as an unproblematically um you know as associational by marriage or what is called in migration studies as dependent migration a review of literature shows that women's uh, immigrant women's experiences have been subdued because they have under men so they have been completely ignored or misrepresented but they were treated as migrants wives or dependent migrants and this has been the center of my study for a long time but it is no longer accurate to say that the portrayal of women in the diaspora is the same as it was say from the 50 years ago so we moved from adding women in a feminist empiricist sense to bringing women from the margins to the center to giving them equal or center stage with other forms of identity such as class um caste feminist scholarship has come a long way by the end of the 20th century so today we are talking about not only the you know female migrant but how do we actually understand so tejaswini niranjana's landmark work about the diaspora in the caribbean looks at the role women played out in the early 20th century campaign against indentured servitude in the caribbean niranjana reveals india's disavowal of an indentured woman hardly looked at in you know the indentured woman depraved by her forced labor in trinidad as central to its own anti colonial struggle there've been a lot of studies on women slaves you know in the whole history of africana and there is a lot of parallels there women of course have been part of different types of forced labor in other parts of africa and asia so contemporary work of saskia sassen on nannies maids and sex workers in the first world from the third world so in the filipina maid uh, that goes and takes care of the children of someone in canada is actually outsourcing her own children to extended family back in the philippines so why is that happening of course for economic compulsions but what are the repercussions but if you look say since i brought the philippine thing 
Sasan study shows you that the remittances and that's a very important word today. What are the remittances? And one of my students has been working, uh, she's fin just finished her PhD. She's talking about the social remittances. You know that Peggy Leavitt had coined this term social remittances because what is it that you're bringing back when you return? Not just money, but you're also bringing back, you know, lifestyle and other kinds of things in that kind of return. So the IT world has to some extent broken the structures of patriarchy and allowed women. So I am saying women are not just in one track but they are also in several other kinds of things. So the call center scene has created a hierarchy in the world which one has to acknowledge. Many women have so slowly changed their gender practices whether it is outside or home. But there still are cases of forced labour and the attempt to encourage the illegal entry, so we bring it again, you know, so much time was spent yesterday on the Cobra Garde case, but one needs to, uh, you know, ascertain and underline the fact that, you know, what is the caste class background? So does class subsume caste in this kind of a context and how, do, what does privilege actually mean? So who pays whom, how much, all these things become very, very important. Um, and in the... Uh, places like US, UK and all you have a whole lot of work. Maggie Abraham's work on marital violence among Indian immigrants in the US shows that you know the whole aspect of you know the problem is very very different. If you watch uh, the Gurinder Chadda film uh, that uh, you know Aishwarya Rai actually dealing plays the Sikh immigrant victim of domestic violence it gives you a very very interesting fact where she murders her abusive husband and then goes to prison and bonds with the other women you know in that context so what class are these so when you look at women we are looking at illegal domestic workers we are looking at caregivers we are looking at IT professionals doctors entrepreneurs they have been everywhere so I think what I am trying to say is today, the, I would end on the note that both migration and diaspora theories have begun to reinvent themselves, you know, including feminist theory, trying to privilege gender as well and moving away from the androcentric frameworks of migration uh, to feminist empiricism at the beginning and finally looking at contemporary centrality of gender alongside class, race, religion, ethnicity and community is a very, very important part of diaspora studies. And I think diaspora theories of migration today have looked at women as architects and partners in the globalizing waves of movements of people as well. I'd like to also talk, uh, you know, one last point I'd like to make is migration within the nation. And that, of course, when we're talking about migration within the nation, there's been tremendous amount of work on, you know, the underclass of migration, which often again includes women, it includes Dalits, it includes tribals and I think today uh, there is a reinvention of the whole thematic genre of migration studies and I don't think it can be restricted by either boundaries or borders. I don't believe that we are going toward a borderless world because racism continues to prevail very, very strongly in the world. But I think that the malleability of borders is a very, very interesting study. Thank you very much. We will take questions now. Uh, so if you have any really questions, please raise them. I wanted to know what you mentioned about the colonial engagement with the Indian context, within the Indian context and the, and the in-migration which we are talking about. So, if you compare that uh, in-migration during the colonial period would have been not as much as right now because of the several changes which we have witnessed, for example, modernization, westernization, urbanization and so on. So, how do we understand like the impact of colonization and the issue of migration Beginning. And what changes do you see that which has come uh, historically in India from colonization to now, after post war? Big one. So I don't know if I'll be able to do <laughs> justice to that, but uh, and I'm not a historian. Let me put that 
Uh, yeah, uh, like if up in front. So my understanding, you know, I can, like I tell people, you know, I can take liberties with time periods very easily as a sociologist. You know, I can jump from one century to the other without that guilt of being a historian. So I have an advantage. So the debate has remained. You know, what does migration really mean in that sense? So of course, everything. It's a post-colonial condition, you know, the fact that we are all speaking in English today. You know, can I lecture to you in a language that all the rest of us get? I can't. So obviously, you know, we can't, uh, it's a part of history, whether we want to give the agency to the past set or not. You know, the, the next colony to the post-colony is a metaphor, yes, but it's also a reality. What are the conditions that have? Washing 
अभ्यासक स्वर तो हाईअर लेवल डोमेस्टिक वर्क ऑफ कुकिंग एंड केयर केयर ऑफ कुकिंग फॉर द एल्डरली इट कुड बी फॉर वी हैव अ वेरी हाई ग्रेइंग इंडिया नाउ सो द सैंडविच जेनरेशन लाइक अस आर कॉट विद हैविंग टू केयर फॉर ओल्डर्स पीपल ऑफ द फैमिली एंड यंग सो यू सर्विसिंग द सर्विस क्लास फीमेल लेबर प्राइमरीली इज हेल्पिंग द मिडिल क्लास टेक केयर ऑफ द यंग एंड ओल्ड so that's a huge new economy and the migrant is still being exploited with no good ways about it however if you go and interview them she say i am much better off than when i was back home so that all cynthia hero syndrome about you know the levi's jeans and the female labor in indonesia where the woman in indonesia was being paid the least compared to the korean woman who speak or a man or in america so you don't talk about it. you know so but ultimately who is profiting with the jeans which cost 30 dollars or whatever so it's obviously but then the indonesian woman will say that her wages have been doubled for what she was working in paris but it's still being classified as unskilled being paid less in that context so there is a whole you know a uh, range of exploitation that is going on at you know, on that level a gender class i can go into the details of this this is woman is probably a muslim woman so that is also something for your um so you know the